Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Apples and Genos Fantasy Hockey Podcast. My name is Nate Grunivlink, and I'll be your host. Today, I'm back to continuing my strategy series where I interview someone in the fantasy hockey space regarding different aspects of fantasy hockey strategy. The aim here is that we just all get better together and we're able to gather some strategy tips and tricks from all the sharpest minds out there. And for this show, I'm pleased to welcome Nick Alberga, who covers fantasy hockey for Sportsnet and is co-host of the NHL.com Fantasy on Ice podcast. Nick, how are you doing? I'm fantastic. I'm honored that you called me a sharp voice and a mind because I don't know if I feel that way, but I've been playing fantasy hockey for a long time. So it's uh, my pleasure to join you. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Well, why don't we why don't we jump into that? How long have you been playing for and what led you to your position or positions, I should say now? Yeah, it's it really is crazy, Nate, just sort of the journey in fantasy hockey. So I'm 32 now. To the best of my recollection, I started playing fantasy hockey around 13 or 14. Um, that's pretty much, you know, in line with when my passion for hockey really took off. A lot of people don't understand, uh, don't realize that my first sport was actually baseball and I was religious about baseball. I was really good in baseball. Okay. And then naturally just, you know, being a Canadian, you know, being from Montreal and all of that, having a father who loved the Montreal Canadians, it naturally just progressed into me loving hockey. And, uh, you know, I'll be the first to admit I'm not a, as good as hockey in hockey as I am in baseball. Uh, but I've loved the sport for a long, long time. And that led me to the fantasy world. Right. I just think it adds a different element. And this is like 20 years ago, which is crazy to say, because it seems like just yesterday and then. Ever since I've been playing, and I, I've really fallen in love with that aspect of the sport, is the fantasy side of it. Yeah, yeah, it's obviously great, or we wouldn't both be here. So true. Uh, yeah. Why? Why don't you tell us uh, what's your favorite NHL team? And if it's not the Leafs, then tell me why I should abandon the Leafs and cheer for them instead. Yeah, I know it's funny when you sort of sent me a list of criteria and material you wanted to talk about. Uh, I sort of chuckled at that because you know I live in Toronto now. I was actually born in Quebec. Um, so I could answer this way. Uh, growing up, I was a diehard Leafs fan, if you can believe it, with my father being a Canadians fan. We moved to Ontario so quickly. I was like five years old that I never got accustomed, thankfully, to being a Montreal Canadiens fan. <laughs> but um, I was a Leafs fan growing up. I would say it's a lot different now. And perhaps it's been working in the industry for the last decade that sort of desensitized me to having you know, one true team that I cheer for. Now it's like I watch hockey on a daily basis. Like right now I'm watching Detroit and Minnesota as record here on a Monday night. Like I, I love watching the game more than just one singular team. I guess, I guess if there were, the Leafs would ever win one day, yeah, I would be excited. I'd be jacked more so for like 13 year old me, because I was that kid on the couch eating popcorn, drinking pop and crying when the Leafs would be eliminated from the Stanley Cup playoffs. I can't say I'm at that level. When they lose, I'm like, whatever, yeah. move on. Um, but I would say it was like a childhood dream, um, you know, having worked and covered the Leafs, uh, you know, for the last two years, not anymore, but I was the Leafs radio host for a couple of years. So that was like living uh, a childhood dream, but not so much anymore. That's uh, in long my answer, but I love the sport clearly. For sure. All right, so let's dive into some fantasy talk here. First off, let's just get what's your favorite format to play? Like cats versus points, you know, head to head, roto, what is it? Yeah, from day one, it's been head to head. Like I, I've been in, in roto leagues, it's just not the same feel. And, you know, I've played fantasy baseball, I've played fantasy basketball. basketball. I think different sports are, are good for different types of cats. Like, for instance, sure. baseball, I don't mind the rotisserie outlook. But from a hockey point of view, I, I'm really standard. I like standard cats. I don't even really subscribe to hits. I know that's a standard cat these days. I prefer penalty minutes if you're going to have it because i just don't think there's body contact in this league anymore yeah. uh but i i'm really really basic i'm really really standard i like points um and i like head to head sure yeah i don't think i have a preference at this point uh sign me up for whatever I'll yeah and a way to enjoy it so <laughs> true true um so talking a little bit about this point that we're at now in the season you know it's uh i think we're in week 16 of the yahoo uh calendar if you're playing on yahoo so what should fantasy managers be most concerned about kind of at this point in the season that maybe differs from the rest of the year? Well, it's like an interesting question because of like everything we've had to deal with from a fantasy perspective, say the last couple of years, right? And this one specifically with all the, the game postponements, the cancellations, the canceling of the Olympics, they rejigged the schedule in Yahoo. Like it's been quite frankly, a season from hell in fantasy hockey. I think clearly one thing to watch for is how turbulent the goaltending position is, how volatile things can be, where 
it looks like, you know, for example, your Maple Leafs, Jack Campbell's the number one. Next thing you know, he struggles for like a month and a half. And yeah. I don't know if Mrazek's going to overtake him, but I think he's going to push him for some playing time. So that's probably the one thing I would I would say moving forward is make sure you have your finger on the pulse of goaltending and fantasy hockey because there's a couple of volatile situations like Toronto comes to mind and certainly what's happening in St. Louis. You talk about sure. one of the pickups of the year in fantasy hockey, Ville Husso who's in a contract year and the way Jordan Bennington has been struggling as of late, I think there's an opportunity there, but yeah, it's just been like a really, really weird year. And I think in general, like even to talk about the Genesis of my time playing fantasy hockey in the early days, I knew I could draft Martin Bredernate and he would play like 75 games a year. Right. <laughs> it's a lot different uh, from a goaltending aspect than it was maybe 15, 20 years ago. So I'd say the goaltending is something to watch for moving forward. For sure. Now, that kind of leads me into a question around uh, zero G. I don't know if this has ever come across your radar at all before, but uh, I wrote an article this offseason, generated a bit of conversation around uh, basically what I've called zero G. It's basically just fading goalies in your drafts, and basically uh, you try to work the waiver wire all season long just because goalies are so unpredictable. And I had some stats to back this up and stuff, but... Um, I'm curious uh, if that's an approach that you've taken, if it's something you do, or if you have an argument against it. I'm curious your take on it. Well, put it, the, yeah, like, the, you know, that's a really, really good debate. And, you know, it stems from the conversation of strategy in general when it comes to your fantasy drafts, regardless of your league setup or format. Um, you know, I would say the one constant, and I, I'm sure you would agree with this, like Andre Vasilevsky is the guy, like, I think if you have the ability, the opportunity to draft him in your top 10, you have to do so. He's just above and beyond, in my opinion, the best fantasy goalie. And I know the the numbers so far don't dictate that, but considering when he's healthy and playing, like I just don't know who beats him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, even looking at my preseason top five fantasy goalies, I think only like two of the five are actually in the top five this year. Um, it just speaks volumes to how volatile the position is. Naturally, like it, it's got to be a feel in the draft because I get this question a lot in preseason going into the season, what do I do with my goaltending? You have to feel your draft out. Like for instance, in, in one of my leagues, it's a 14 team uh, league. Uh, I, I jumped the gun a tad and went after Darcy Camper, who I actually pegged as maybe a second round pick. And now I'm sort of reaping the benefits of that here in the second half gets the shutout okay. uh, back the other night. Um, I think he's in store for a strong st- second half. As you know, I'm big on contract years. So there's a lot that goes into that conversation. I don't think there's one fixed formula on how to uh, attack your goaltending, but I do think you're on to something. And, you know, one of my colleagues at NHL Network Radio, Boomer Gordon, often talks about it, how he, you know, again, like you have to be very specific on your draft, but it isn't, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the dumbest decision will say to wait in your draft and wait for a guy to fall. Because I think there's obviously a lot of value deeper in your draft when it comes to goaltending, right? I'm sure you found value this season. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the season I've been rolling with Jonathan Quick, then flip to Cal Peterson. Now that he's seemed to be starting to take over that situation, James Reimer has been terrific for me, um, and I think I've avoided maybe some of the pitfalls of the guys higher up, the Robin Lenners. Yeah, um, I haven't had to deal with Darcy Kemper because I wasn't going to take him at price. I haven't had to deal with that first half just to get to the second half of the season. Yeah, um, so. I think uh, it it just sets you up well out of the draft, and then you can really focus on the position and waiver wires. And because the position is so volatile, I like focusing on it that way uh, because I feel like you really should be. I think you got to pay attention to goalies because they are so volatile. Even even the ones you think are going to be great, uh, they can fall off. Um, we've seen it with several goalies in the past few years. Carter Hart was a huge pick last year. He was kind yeah. of a poster boy for this when I wrote the article in the off season. Um, Leonard would be one for this year, probably. Um, there's always these guys who you think are going to be terrific and then they just kind of, they kind of fall off. So, um, just trying to avoid some, some pitfalls that way, I guess. Yeah. And I think in general, it's tough to quantify with the, the, the younger goalies too. Like, you know, and mm-hmm. not to, to toot my own horn. Like I, I had a beat on Spencer Knight this season. I was staying away from him at all costs in standard leagues, you know, non-keeper leagues, of course. I just, I didn't like the feeling there. And Sigurd Rabrowski's had a really, really good year, but I think, you know, what we've seen the last couple of years, specifically a name you just brought up in Carter Hart, who's still trying to find his footing. I think it's acceptable and fair to comprehend that it takes a couple of years just because somebody's a phenom. Like sure. another example is Jake Ottinger, but I always like to pin it back to like a guy like Connor Hellebuck, right? Like it, it took three or four or five years for this guy to find his footing in the league. And 
we all knew the accolades and the resume and the pedigree that he brought to the table. So I think that throws another wrench into the conversation as people get all horned up about some of these younger goalies and don't mm -hmm. fully, you know, think about full picture and long picture that these guys are young and they're going to make mistakes and shooters are going to find their way on them. So that's like a different aspect. But I like that formula in general. Like, you know, I think if you were to ask me what a strategy is for me when it comes to goaltending in my fantasy draft, I like to get like a full fledged number one early, which is harder to find. As you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of teams going with tandems these days, like a good majority of this league. So I like to find that guy, but I'm a Vasilevsky guy, thick and thin. I'm only in a couple leagues and I, I, I find a way to get Vasi because I just love him so much. And knock on wood, the best thing about Vasi, he's always healthier, seemingly always healthy, which is huge when it comes to goaltending. For sure. Yeah, if you can find that workhorse stud who's always playing yeah. and uh, not getting injured, then that's obviously a huge benefit, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of your format, really. All right, so let's dive into this. I kind of like these uh, these three kind of layered questions that I've been sure. asking to a bunch of people. The first one, um, for a first-time fantasy manager, maybe this is their first season uh, playing fantasy, what do you think is the most important thing that people got to get a get a hold of to really you know get into the sport and enjoy it? Well, chuck your favorite team out the window. Like, I think that's the biggest <laughs> advice is, you know, I've played with first timers before way back in the day, and they're just so indebted to their beloved team, whoever they like, and they stack their roster with the entire team. It just, there's, there's no sense in rostering your favorite fourth liner on, you know, I don't know, Columbus. Like you, you have to be wise. And I think you have to throw the fact that you're a fan of a team out the window and, Number two, I would just say have fun. Like people put so much pressure on themselves when it comes to fantasy. Just have fun. It's a beautiful sport. And again, I just think it adds a different wrinkle, a different element. When you can watch an out-of-market game and be cheering for a team and a player, I think just adds so much more value to the sport. But yeah, that's, a, that's probably the one takeaway I would say is that people take their fandom into fantasy. And that's probably the first rule of advice I would give people when playing fantasy. Right. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, so what would be then the next step? So say it's the same guy, he's coming back for his next season. He enjoyed the first season enough that he wants to do it again, but he actually wants to, you know, try to win this year. I would say like be on top of line combinations. Uh, you know, I think it obviously in like, you know, doing it at our level, I think clearly we're, we do this recreationally and like we're really into it. So like I'm constantly looking at lines and I watch a lot of hockey. Like I'm the guy watching hockey at 10 30 at night. I'm the wa guy watching at seven. Like I just, you know, everything. Um, yeah. I, I don't expect people to get to that level, but I think have a really, really good understanding of, of line combinations throughout the league. Like for example, as we speak this week, obviously the Edmonton Oilers have a five game slate. Um, I've been pegging Minnesota for the last couple of days, a guy like Freddie Goodrow, the second line in general, right? With Kevin Fiala and Matt Boldy, as we speak, has a couple goals, the rookie for the wild. So I think it's all about finding value. And if you read my material and listen to my podcast, I talk about value and extracting value. That's where you find your value. And with that, you find value in line combinations, not just in the preseason, but as the season goes on, guys catch fire, trends, themes. I think the, the biggest piece of advice is try to stay ahead of your opponents. And I like to bring that up specifically when it comes to the fantasy playoffs. Mm -hmm. All right. So then kind of the last evolution, you might say, what takes someone from, you know, they're, they can win a, they can win a Yahoo public league now, um, but they get into a, a league with a bunch of people who've been playing for 10 years and mm -hmm. suddenly it's a, it's a whole nother kettle of fish. How do they take that next step and dominate that kind of level of competition? Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Like, it, you know, it goes a, a league league by league basis, clearly. Um, you know, I think clearly, again, being a step ahead of your opponent, identifying players, second half players. Um, I like to pimp guys in contract years, too. Again, and, and to bring a full circle, like it's all about va value and finding value. Like this time of year, obviously, it's trade deadline time, March 21st, the NHL trade deadline. And I think you start to earmark players. Um, on sellers like Claude Giroux comes to mind with the Philadelphia Flyers, Phil Kessel with Arizona, Jacob Chikrin, not necessarily a rental, but he's a guy who's likely to go. I think that's another, you know, level to find value on guys who are really sticking up the joint in their current teams and are ready to take that next step and, you know, boost, uh, when it comes to a fantasy stock point of view with their new respective teams. So something to monitor too, I think this time year would be trends and trades and, you know, it's it's really, you know, to answer that third question, like it's tough to quantify what puts you over the top. It's it just, I think you got to be alert and uh, roll with the punches. Yeah. Yeah, I've, uh, 
I've pondered it myself, obviously, as I've been asking a lot of people. Yeah. I, I, there's just no, I don't think, one golden ticket that takes you there, right? But uh, I know for myself, I have Twitter notifications on for, you know, a few dozen NHL accounts. And I'm getting yeah. lines as soon as they come out. And I'm getting the news as soon as it comes out. Um, so really, once you get to that level, I think you've got to be just on top of everything almost as soon as it comes out and be the first to everything. It's like a full-time job, right? Yeah. <laughs> like it depends. It depends how serious you want to get about your leagues. And it depends clearly in how much money, if you're putting money or if you're, you know, it's just for recreation. I think that's that next level. There's a lot of people out there who play for some serious coins. So you want to have the inside track the best you can, right? For sure. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about draft strategy. Uh, if you're sure. going into your drafts, do you have some kind of step-by-step -step process you go through no matter what, or is every league just kind of unique? Well, first and foremost, I don't really pay attention. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll pin this, like, on Yahoo. I play Yahoo. I know there's ESPN. I know there's a couple other leagues out there, but I play Yahoo. I pay no attention to their to, to their rankings. Uh, in fact, I make <laughs> my own rankings, as you know, for sportsnet.ca. And yep. Uh, I'm religious about those rankings and they've worked in the past and they will continue to work. Like you have to yeah. believe in what you put forth. So that's probably the first thing I do is go into the edit ranking system in Yahoo and input my own rankings. And mm -hmm. again, this is going to be more, you know, more relevant to the statistics and standard cats or the categories I should say that you have in your respective leagues. Right. Like if you have shorthanded goals, obviously it's going to wait a little higher. Um, I like to tinker with my rankings above that when, you know, pertaining to what type of league I'm in. But that's probably the first thing I do before mm -hmm. I even contemplate and identify players I want to draft is is put my draft rankings in there. And then as the draft goes on, like I there's certain players I believe in more than others. Obviously, I write articles on contract year guys and bounce back candidates. Like there's a lot of different things that go into the formula as to how I identify a player. And I'll be honest, like there's times where I don't get guys right. Like Carter Hart's a prime example where I expected a bounce back. Like I think he's been pretty decent. Philadelphia just can't win. He's around league yeah. average when it comes to to uh you know his statistics and sometimes take the fall and sometimes you hit like jacob markstrom was a guy i was all over this season and he's been Same. tremendous yeah like you know when as we speak he's got eight shutouts contender for the vesna trophy so you're gonna hit on some you're not gonna hit on others but that's probably the biggest thing i would say off the get-go when it comes to the preseason is i put my rankings together and i go from there yeah yeah i've uh i would say i'm pretty similar in that regard i do uh projections uh for generally kind of the top six of every team and the top def two or three defensemen, depending on the team. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I kind of modify those. If it's a points league, then I just kind of figure out the points that I have them projected for, and I can rank them that way. If it's a cat's league, then I have a little bit more of a involved uh, kind of formula for it. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd say I'm pretty much the same. I, I set it up the way I want it. I'm not, exactly. uh, I'm not paying attention to, <laughs> to what they're uh, putting out there. So uh, for the listeners, I would say find somebody you trust um, or even find a bunch of people you trust. If they're all talking about the same guys, then that's a pretty good indication, right, that you should be, uh, you should be into those guys if they're all fading the same guys. Uh, and then there's going to be somewhere some people are in and some people are out. And those mm -hmm. are probably probably actually somewhere there's probably some upside and some downside. Um, so all all factors to to weigh there for sure. Yeah. And that's like, you know, the one thing people do in general when they do their fantasy drafts, whether it be football or, or baseball or basketball or hockey is like they identify individuals who do it religiously and do it professionally. And I think you want sleepers and it's all about finding value. You want sleepers, you want bounce back people. You want you know players to stay away from and i think that content is out there wherever you look for it whether it's nhl.com or or daily face off or you know sportsnet my work and I, obviously i work closely now with the nhl.com folks too uh, that material is going to be out there because i think from you know the individuality of just being a fantasy owner and a fantasy player for 20 years that's probably the first thing you look at preparing for your drafts right mm -hmm. absolutely all right, let's talk for one second here just about waiver strategy. Um, mm -hmm. You talk about extracting that value. So how are you extracting value from the waiver wire just on a week-to-week -week basis? So I'll answer this question assuming that I'm playing in a head-to-head -head league. Um, I'm, I'm really, really big in schedule manipulation. And you know, every week, as you know, when I put out my 20 fantasy thoughts on sportsnet.ca, 
I dissect the upcoming schedule again, for example, this week, the Edmonton Oilers are a team of interest. They play five times. So you want to look at guys like Evan Bouchard and Jesse Pugliarvi and Kyler Yamamoto. You just want guys who are playing and it's, you know, especially playoff time. I find a lot of success, especially guys who play on light nights. Like you want guys who play Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. Um, So that's probably my, my, my biggest tactic. I know my buddies get rattled because I make like 3000 pickups a year. But I have five a week, and I usually use those five uh, to manipulate the schedule. And just the way I see it, if I can get maybe four or five extra games to my roster than the opponent, I just think it sets me up in a position to win some categories I prob- probably wouldn't, right? Right, for sure. Now, would that strategy vary at all You know, early in the season to late in the season? Are you trying to accomplish different things, or is it the same pretty much all year long? That's a good question, because I think early on, say maybe the first 25 to 30 games, I'm probably in assessment mode where I'm looking at my roster, looking at guys that I think are long-term fixtures and maybe guys that I missed on in my draft or guys that are available on the waiver wire. Once the season gets going and now we're into February, soon to be into March, um, I know which guys are interchangeable and it's the same two, three, four guys on my roster that I'm willing to dump them and move on. For example, like Matt Boldy's a guy I picked up this week, Freddie Goodrow. Um, I think you have to jump on that, but you have to identify first what guys on your roster you feel you can cut and you won't you won't stay up late thinking about um, you know, cutting these guys. Cause that's, that's probably that, you know, the biggest advice I would say is like identify guys on your roster that you're like, okay, I'll dump you. Um, because that's schedule manipulation is that. So you have to identify a couple of spots in your roster. You're ready to, to move on from. For sure. And would that strategy vary based on how well you're doing or how poorly you're doing? Like if you're, if you're sitting pretty right now, you're in first place up by yeah. a million points. Is it different than if you're kind of that bubble team scrapping? Yeah, certainly. Like, you know, for example, I'm only in two leagues this year. I'm usually in four, but things have changed and leagues have stopped. Um, But in one of my leagues, I'm in first place by like 26 points now. So I'm not being as aggressive when it comes to the waiver wire. I'm having more of a long term approach and guys who are struggling. I might take a flyer on, for example, Cole Caulfield's a guy who was dropped maybe a month ago and I'm playing the big picture approach with him. I like the new head coach. I like the fact that he's what scored two goals in three games now. And I just think, you know, the perspective changes depending on where you're at in the standings. Like I get questions. I'm sure you do all the time. Um, you know, it, it really, really depends on where you're at in the standings and and how urgent you are uh, to find results. But I think if you're in the driver's seat, for example, like me in that one league, I think you can have long, long term picture in mind and don't have to be as aggressive on the waiver wire, if that makes sense. Absolutely. All right, Nick. Well, I don't want to keep you. That's all the topics I've got. Why don't you go ahead just tell the people where they can follow you on socials and catch up with everything you're doing. And I appreciate you having me again. You can find me on Twitter at the Golden Muzzy, on Instagram at the Golden Muzzy, and of course, alongside Pete Jensen on the NHL Fantasy on Ice podcast. It's available wherever you find your podcast and on YouTube. Uh, we do it twice a week, every Monday and every Thursday. We were just at Fanfare in Vegas, had some great uh, interaction there, great guests there as well. So we're on top of the fantasy game and also on sportsnet.ca. I put out a couple articles a week, uh, one on uh, Friday, my weekly mailbag, and one on Sunday, my 20 fantasy thoughts. So uh, yeah, I'm pretty much everywhere right now, Nate. Awesome. Well, <laughs> Nick, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for joining me uh, and providing these strategies for the listeners. My pleasure. Thanks so much for listening. Take care. All right, that's all I've got for this episode. Hopefully it brought you some value, helped you get a little bit better at fantasy hockey today. If you do have a minute, throw a quick review and rating on podcasts. It would mean a lot to me. It would help get this podcast into more ear holes. Make sure you find your way into the Apples and Geno's Discord community. The best way, in my opinion, to get instant fantasy advice from knowledgeable people, including myself, and as well as just meet some new people with a common interest. And that's it, folks. Much love.